Bleach Movie 1 was released in Japan on December 16th, 2006, the week that Bleach Episode 107 aired on TV. When a long-running shonen series goes on long enough, the anime studios usually produce a yearly movie to help push the momentum of the franchise. My first experience with anime movies would be the 13 Dragon Ball Z movies. They had an average runtime of 50 minutes and featured storylines which had very inconsistent writing. Some of the movies were better than others, but for the most part, anime movies based on popular shonen anime are known for being point and boring. Bleach Movie 1 was the first anime movie I watched outside of the DBZ movies. It had a feature length movie runtime of 93 minutes which was the first positive. I remember that I felt that the story would not be under the same time constraints that the DBZ movies were notorious for. I hated how DBZ movies set up a big stage, a villain and a final fight which just rushes to a conclusion with the protagonist conveniently unleashing their signature arse pull attack to end the fight. What I liked about this Bleach movie was that it was telling a story that it wanted you to feel in invested in. It wasn't just a one-off villain appearing and a cool fight at the end. Despite memories of nobody having some of these elements in the story, it does give fans a little bit more. What I always found fun about the Bleach movies was that the opening and endings of the anime would change to feature clips from the movies to help to promote them. That was another incentive to check out the movies. Seeing some of the cool battles and movie exclusive characters as the subbed episodes were being released really built up a hype for the movies at the time. Not only the Bleach movies, but anime movies in general would not be available for international fans until months later when the movie had concluded its theatrical run and was released on DVD for fan subbers to purchase so that they could rip and sub it for the rest of the world. Back in 2006 it was a different time, unlike today where major anime movies like Dragon Ball Super Brothy and One Piece Stampede which are released in cinemas in the west just a few weeks after their Japanese theatrical debuts. I remember feeling really anticipated to watch this first Bleach movie. So Memories of Nobody can be assumed to take place outside of the Bleach canon and serves as a side story never meant to meet up with the ongoing timeline of the manga or anime. Some fans do dispute that the movie is canon and even Kubo does mention watching the movie in some interviews, but I have always considered it as a filler additional side story. The movie begins with Ichigo and Rukia coming across spirits called Blanks. This is where we are introduced to the mysterious Shinigami called Sena who destroys the Blanks with the Shikai release of a Zanpakuto. It appears that Sena has forgotten what Shinigami division she belongs to and she attacked the Blanks because she felt it was the right thing to do. Rukia puzzled by the appearance of Senna and the Blanks heads back to the Soul Society to report about the strange occurrences. Meanwhile, Ichigo is tasked to stay with Senna and to not let her out of his sight. We see that Senna appears to be carefree and laid back, while Ichigo tries to get some answers out of her about who she is. Hitsugaya interrupts Ichigo and takes him to Urahara's shop to inform him that a city within the human world suddenly appeared above the Serete. Urahara explains that the human world and the Serete remain separate due to the Dungai which exists between them, but a new dimension has appeared within the Dungai a few days ago, which has grown larger in size, to the point that it now connects the human world to the Serete. Urahara concludes that this is the reason that the human world is appearing in the Serete. Ichigo also adds that he encountered the Blanks earlier, which prompts Hitsugaya to mention the Valley of Screams. Urahara explains that some souls can accidentally be removed from the process of passing over to the Soul Society, leading to them becoming lost and destined to wander the Dangai aimlessly. Urahara continues by stating that when a large collection of lost souls gather within the Dangai, it forms a new dimensional space called the Valley of Screams. And it is here within the Valley of Screams that a soul has its energy and memory separated so that they may return to the natural cycle and be reincarnated into the soul society. The blanks that Ichigo saw earlier were spirit energy which have had their memories removed. This prompts Ichigo to ask what happens to their memories if the spirit energy becomes blanks. Urahara reveals that the memories of all of the spirits merge into one being. This entity then returns to the human world and is known as the Shinenju. Although the Valley of Screams is a natural phenomenon and has occurred previously without consequence, the issue is that this newly formed Valley of Screams is connecting the human world to the Soul Society. Hitsugaya further adds that this is being done intentionally by someone. Kon also remembers seeing a mysterious armoured man standing in the crowd of blanks earlier. Urahara guesses that this individual would have been looking for the Shinenju. While Urahara continues to research the enemy's motives, Ichigo returns to find Senna. He learns that she knows nothing about the Shinenju and the blanks, but she agrees to help Ichigo look for the Shinenju. Senna eventually begins to remember her memories while she was alive. Along with Ichigo's help, she tries to learn more about her past and who she is. The Gotai 13 appear and reveal to Ichigo that there is no present living Shinigami on record with the name Sena. Rukia also reveals that the Zanpakuto Sena was using was lost in the Dangai over 100 years ago, as well as the honor being absorbed by the Valley of Screams. When questioned,
questioned how she arrived in the human world, Sana becomes confused. She can remember several different memories all at once, which don't make any sense and begin to cause her distress. Captain Ukitake reveals that the Shinenju they have been looking for is Sana. They have also learnt that the people behind these strange events are being led by a man called Ganryu, an exile from the Soul Society. He was banished to the Dangai. Hitsugaya reveals that Ganryu's plan is to merge the human world and the Soul Society to cause their destruction. His objective stems from a vendetta against the Soul Society for exiling him. It appears that the Shinenju is the key requirement for Ganryu to complete his goal. Hitsugaya says that they have been ordered to capture Sena. Ichigo objects to them taking Sena as he defends her and her existence. But suddenly Ganryu and his group attack Ichigo and company. They have returned to kidnap Sena, the Shinenju. Ichigo tries to stop Ganryu and his group called the Dark Ones from taking Sena, but he ultimately fails. Ganryu leaves with Sena and begins the final steps of his plan to destroy the two worlds. Ichigo ends up feeling responsible for Sena being kidnapped, and begins to search for an entrance into the Valley of Screams. Urahara states that there should be one near to where the Shinenju Sena first appeared. Eventually finding the entrance, Ichigo enters to save Sena, while Rukia returns to inform the others that they have found it. Meanwhile, in the Valley of Screams, Ganryu explains that Sena is the Shinenju and has the memories of countless souls within her. When the Shinenju is placed within the center of the Valley of Screams, it causes the blanks to gather, searching for their memories. Once near the Shinenju, the blanks collide with each other, rapidly multiplying and causing the expansion of the Valley of Screams, leading to the human world and the Soul Society colliding together. In the Soul Society, Mayuri calculates that they have an hour to stop the destruction of the worlds. Head Captain Yamamoto refuses to send reinforcements to help Ichigo due to the time constraints of an hour, so instead he decides to fire up the Kido cannon to fire at the Valley of Screams. Ichigo arrives to save Sena, he confronts the Dark Ones while Sena is surrounded by blanks. While fighting alone, Ichigo is joined by Kimpachi and the other members of the Gotai 13. While they fend off the Dark Ones, Ichigo heads to Sena to save her. He faces off against the leader of the Dark Ones, Ganryu. He doesn't understand why he wants to save the Shinenju, as it is just a collection of memories and thoughts. But Ichigo defends Sena by saying that she is alive and here now. Ichigo could feel how afraid Sena was, knowing that she wanted help. In typical fashion, Ichigo has sworn to protect Sena, and persists through fighting Ganryu. The Dark Ones are defeated by the Gotai 13 while Ichigo gets closer to Sena. Ganryu rushes towards Ichigo while he charges a Getsuka Tensho that he fires at Ganryu. At last, the enemy's leader is defeated and turns to Ash. Ichigo rescues Sena and leaves the Valley of Screams, returning to the human world. However, the Valley of Screams is still expanding and is linked to the human world and Shinigami world. Sena realizes that she can use the power of the blanks to return everything back to normal. She tells Ichigo she doesn't want the world that Ichigo lives in to be destroyed. Sena destroys the Valley of Screams and stops the destabilization of both worlds, returning everything back to normal. As a final request, Sena asks Ichigo to carry her to the graveyard where she believes her family rest. Sena, who at this point is clinging on to life, tells Ichigo that she lived nearby and lived here with her family. She asks Ichigo Ichigo to check her name on the gravestone. It is a bittersweet finale as Sena asks Ichigo if her name is on the gravestone, but Ichigo doesn't see her name written on it. But to make her feel at ease before she disappears, Ichigo tells her that her name is there, making her feel like she was truly once alive in this world, that she grew to love. Ichigo affirms to her that she lived in this town with her family and was certainly alive before becoming a Shinenju. Sena, feeling happy hearing this, begins to fade away. Rukia later tells Ichigo that as the blank's energy completely disappears, so will the memory of Sena, since you cannot remember someone who didn't exist in the first place. The movie concludes with a post credit scene, with Ichigo walking while seeing a red hair ribbon similar to the one Sena had been wearing. He can hear a girl running towards him while she is talking to her friends. She runs past Ichigo as he realizes she looks just like Sena. Ichigo smiles as he remembers her, and continues walking forward. When it comes to anime movies, they never really live up to the expectations that are set out by the show that they are based off of, but the first Bleach movie left me feeling pleasantly surprised. It isn't perfect, and it does have some problems, but I really found it to be enjoyable. Firstly, the characters from the show are all here, accompanied by Sena, who quickly becomes a much-loved character. Sena has a personality which is full of life, and a love for being alive. She is curious, full of energy, and strong-willed. Despite being stubborn, her strong character is broken when she is haunted by memories of pasts which contradict any reasonable timeline she tries to relate them to. She 
even tells Ichigo how afraid she is, and he can see her visibly shaking. It is definitely heart-wrenching to see her exhibit such a carefree love for life, but to realise she never was meant to exist. Throughout this movie, everyone constantly tells Ichigo that she is nothing but a shinenju, but he refuses to just accept her as a tool or a byproduct of the Valley of Screams. Ichigo adopts the shonen trope of, I don't care what you say, this person's life matters because they are alive trope. Ichigo helps Senna and validates her concerns once he realises the sadness associated with her existence. The ending to Senna's story shows that she cares for and respects Ichigo, as she sacrifices herself to save the human world and the soul society, ensuring the world Ichigo lives in is not destroyed. I loved how Ichigo reassures Senna in the final scenes of the movie, making her life feel validated. Senna cries as she hears Ichigo confirm she lived once. As a fun fact, Kubo mentions in the Bleach Jet art book, which was released in 2018, that Senna's character design is the design that he intended to use for Renji and Rukia's daughter, Ichika Abarai. He even goes on to say that their designs only differ when it comes to their colour schemes. The movie is scored with the same soundtrack from the anime, which I found to be a great choice, along with music composed just for the movie, which is a nice treat for fans of the anime score. I definitely enjoyed the character interactions and the slice of life moments in this movie. I didn't particularly remember any of the battles or enemies for that matter. They were very forgettable and their motive seemed rather generic and unoriginal. The story is pretty predictable and can slow down especially during the moments when Ichigo and Senna are not present. And there wasn't really any plot twist aside from Senna sacrificing herself at the very end of the movie. As you watch the movie and try to piece together what the blanks are and who Senna is and who is behind the creation of the Valley of Screams, initially it is a very interesting concept and the ideas do enough to pull you into the story, but in the end I only really continue to be invested in Senna's character and the mystery surrounding her origin. Personally, I couldn't care less for a banished clan who wants to destroy the Soul Society. The movie was in need of a more memorable villain who can back up the level of threat that the movie was promising. Despite the movie setting up a time limit of an hour until the world is destroyed, the tension just doesn't feel present because the villains are predictably defeated. Like how Goku defeats almost all of the movie villains with an arse pull spirit bomb, Ichigo uses his signature Getsuka Tensho to defeat Ganryu. I am glad that the movie brought back almost all of the characters from the series, but some of them have little to no consequence if they weren't there. I didn't see the point of Uryu, Chad or some of the Gotai 13 being in this movie. Aside from familiarity, I didn't see much of a point in including so many characters that we see so little of. Despite the flaws within the movie, I still enjoyed it a lot. Memories of Nobody is entertaining enough to keep fans of the anime and manga engaged, but there is little here to enjoy if you have never seen or read Bleach, particularly due to the movie featuring many concepts and characters from the show itself. Senna and the enemies are the only new characters featured within the movie. Understandably, it would be confusing for newcomers. I love pieces of media which leave fans with endings that are open to interpretation. The ending to Memories of Nobody leaves fans wondering if Ichigo's memories were also erased. As he holds a red ribbon, a girl resembling Senna runs past him. Ichigo looks at her and smiles, and decides to continue walking. And for me, this shows that in the end, he didn't forget Senna. The title Memories of Nobody refers to the collection of memories that Senna has as a Shinenju. She is born as someone who should have never existed. She is literally a nobody. The title of the movie fits so well with the story that is played out. The redeeming quality of this movie is the introduction of Senna and her character. You feel sorry for her and can't help but to get emotional at the movie's ending. As the movie progresses, you learn more about her character. And when you understand the significance of what she is and why she keeps remembering different memories, it is is upsetting. The movie largely feels like a prolonged filler episode, but surprisingly I enjoyed it more than any of the filler content featured within the anime. Memories of Nobody also ends with a credit song which is sung by the band Aqua Times, and it rings through with a lot of nostalgia listening to it over 10 years after watching the movie for the first time. I definitely recommend fans of Bleach to watch this movie if they haven't, because it can't hurt to have more fans of Senna and her story. In this video I'm going to prove how Senna is a canon waifu. In order to do this I'm going to talk about how Bleach movie one fits into the timeline of the Bleach manga. Then I'm going to go over every instance that anything from Bleach movie 1 is mentioned within the actual manga. In addition to this, we're also going to talk about what Kubo thinks about the first Bleach movie. And the last point that I'm going to speak about in this video is the state of Ichigo at the end of the movie, referencing him having forgotten about Senna and speaking about the Bleach movie 1 post credit scene. So I'm really excited to talk about the topic of this video because I love Bleach movie 1 and that I know I'm about to make somebody's waifu out there canon. So 
yeah, this is my video on how Bleach Movie 1 is canon to the manga. So the first Bleach movie, Memories of Nobody, debuted in Japanese theatres on the 16th of December 2006. At the start of Volume 25, Kubo had commented on the release of the movie, stating that Bleach is now a movie and the filmmaker's attention to detail is evident in everything from the background art to the story bods. He goes on to say that he thinks it's going to turn out amazing, and people who like the anime will really love it, and those of you who don't like the anime that much may be pleasantly surprised. Kubo himself states that he cannot wait to see it. From this comment, it is evident that Kubo was somewhat involved within the production of the first Bleach movie, whether if that's just overseeing the background art and the storyboards, and giving his approval on the overall story. None of this is actually confirmed and for the most part is just speculation, but from the points that I'm about to make, it's going to be evident that Kubo did actually like the story from Bleach movie 1, as he incorporated some of the elements that were introduced within that story into his own manga. Now the first Bleach movie introduces us to several new characters, of which include Senna and the members of the Ryodoji family, which was once a former noble family within the Soul Society, but they had been exiled over a thousand years ago, and at present they are now referred to as the Dark Ones or the Fallen. We don't really know the reason behind why the Ryodoji family had fallen in status and thus were exiled from the Soul Society, but we do know that after being exiled, the family themselves wanted to be distanced from the Soul Society. The surviving members of the family, united and led by Ganryu, had come to be known as the Dark Ones. They had escaped into the Dangai, and it was not too long after going there where they had arrived within the Valley of Screams. It is within the Valley of Screams they had discovered entities known as Blanks. Blanks are in fact souls which live within a newly introduced dimension called the Valley of Screams, and they no longer possess their memories from the living world. This occurs when souls who migrate from the human world to the Soul Society end up getting lost within the Dangai. These souls end up wandering aimlessly together, and gradually over time they are drawn together. As more and more of these souls come together, they end up creating a whole new dimension called the Valley of Screams. Within the Valley of Screams, these souls are separated into memories and energy. The memories that are separated from the blanks fuse together and return to the living world in order to form what is known as the Shinenju. And the Shinenju that appears within Bleach Movie 1 is of course Senna. So these are the key plot points and concepts that are introduced to us in Bleach Movie 1. Now the main area of interest is the Valley of Screams, which is also referred to as the Kyogoku. Now this is a dimension that forms between the human world and the soul society, and it stems from the Dangai. So before going into how these concepts are introduced into the Bleach manga and the Bleach novels, let's first understand how Memories of Nobody fits into the timeline of the Bleach manga. So within the movie, we clearly see Ichigo activate his Bankai, so we are aware that this definitely takes place after the soul society arc, and sometime before the Fulbring arc. In addition to this, Ichigo doesn't express any surprise to see that Rukia has a Shinigami powers returned. So this confirms that Memories of Nobody has to take place after chapter 201 of the manga, since it is in that chapter that Ichigo first sees Rukia with her Shinigami powers back. So knowing this, we can now propose a very realistic time for where this movie can fit into the timeline of the manga. So between chapters 228 and 229, there is a one month time skip. During this one month time skip, everybody is preparing for the battle against Aizen and his army of Arankars, which is set to take place within the winter. Now we don't really get to see what happens within this one month time skip, so it is for that reason that we can assume that Bleach Movie 1 fits into the timeline of this one month, where everyone was training. So let's now talk about how concepts that are introduced within Memories of Nobody are referenced within the actual manga. Now the first instance of this occurs within the Thousand Year Blood War arc in chapter 625. Yorichi references the Kyogoku or the Valley of Screams, as she describes the Kyogoku as an area where fallen souls exist. She goes on to state that Urahara had figured out that the Kyogoku can maintain itself as a reishi space because of its different reishi structure. During the final arc, Urahara manages to find a way to use the Valley of Screams to his advantage, in order for Ichigo and the others to plan a surprise attack against the Quincy's. Through utilizing a modified Valley of Screams thanks to Riruka and Yukio's abilities, they are able to enter the enemy's territory without releasing any spiritual pressure. Now the Valley of Screams is mentioned once again in chapter 620. 27, when Ichigo advises Yukio and Ruruka to stay behind, while Ichigo and the others enter into the modified Valley of Screams. He tells Ruruka that he has entered the Kyogoku once before, and for somebody who only likes cute things, there isn't anything cute about the Kyogoku. Now we have never seen Ichigo enter into the Valley of Screams within the manga, and the only time that he did in fact enter within the Valley of Screams was during Bleach Movie 1. There is even a panel here that Kubo draws of the Valley of Screams that matches the environment that we see within the 
movie. Now in Bleach Volume 69, at the end of Chapter 627, Kubo draws a sketch where he advises his readers to see the first Bleach movie for more info on the Kyogoku. Now this instance is so fascinating and it is so relevant to the recent Bleach news that we have had. Now we know that Kubo had released a one-shot chapter in August of this year, where he had introduced the possibility of exploring hell in an entirely new story arc. Now if Kubo goes ahead and releases more chapters, then it would be fascinating to see how many concepts from the fourth Bleach movie he carries forward into his work. I have already discussed how much Kubo didn't like the direction of Hellverse in my review of that movie, but despite this, a lot of people still believe Bleach Movie 4 to be canon, because the animation studio claimed that Kubo had a supervisory role within the movie, which Kubo later on went on to denounce in comments that were made on the DVD release of Hellverse. Now this attitude is entirely different to the author notes that I had spoken about at the start of this video from volume 25, where Kubo had expressed how excited he is to see the movie, and he believed that the filmmakers at the time had paid particular attention to detail. Maybe it was because of this that he had no issue with introducing the value of screams into the manga, and even recommending fans to go see movie 1 for more information on the Kyogoku. This is significant because it confirms that Kubo has connected Bleach movie 1 into his story. He even went as far as to confirm that Ichigo had been to the Kyogoku before within chapter 627. Now, aside from being referenced within the Bleach manga, Memories of Nobody is also brought up within the Can't Fear Your Own World light novels. So in chapter 15 of the second volume of Can't Fear Your Own World, Tokinada mentions the Ryodoji family, as he states that the House of Ryodoji were an ancient aristocratic family, who were the first ones to have ventured into the Kyogoku after they had been banished from the great noble houses. They were stripped of their status and were exiled into the Valley of Screams. He goes on to state that it must have been unpleasant for them to have to face their sentence in a completely unknown place. So after having been referenced within the actual manga, and now being referenced within Can't Fear Your Own World, so it is very difficult for me to believe that Bleach Movie 1 isn't canon anymore. So this leaves us with one final problem, which is the state of Ichigo's memories at the end of the movie. Now just before the movie wraps up, just after Senna has died, Rukia states that they will lose their memories of Senna, including their memories of the Valley of Screams and the Ryodoji family. Now in the post credit scene of Bleach Movie 1, Ichigo catches a red hairband, which looks exactly like the one that Senna had been wearing. And as soon as he grabs it, his expression on his face changes, as his eyes widen. Through the shock in his face, you can see that he is remembering. And just after it appears that he has remembered, a girl runs onto the bridge with her friends as she is laughing running towards Ichigo. Ichigo watches her running past him as we see from the close-up that she not only looks but sounds exactly like Senna. After this happens, Ichigo stands still and smiles before he continues on walking. Now this post credit scene for me has always confirmed that Ichigo did not lose his memories, in fact he had regained them. This also explains why he was able to remember that he had been to the Kyogoku in chapter 627. Now funnily enough, Senna also makes a cameo appearance within episode 204 of the anime. During one of the scenes where Ichigo is talking, you can see a girl that is stood behind him. Her hairstyle is strikingly similar to Senna's, and she also has her iconic yellow hair ribbon, which is the same coloured hair ribbon that she wears when she first meets Ichigo in the movie. The last point that I want to mention about Bleach Movie 1 and Senna in general is that Kubo had spoken about her in the Bleach Jet art book. He had stated that Senna's design was actually the design that he was thinking about when he was designing the daughter of Rukia and Renji. He even goes on to say that she is like their child from a parallel universe, and the only difference between Ichika and Senna is their colour schemes. So to summarise all of the points that I've made in this video, Bleach Movie 1 fits into the timeline of the manga during the one month gap where Ichigo and the others were training to defeat Aizen. In chapter 627, Ichigo states that he had been to the Kyogoku before. The Ryodoji family and the Valley of Screams is not only mentioned within the manga, it is also mentioned within the Can't Fear Your Own World light novels. And lastly, at the end of chapter 627, Kubo had even told us to go and watch Bleach Movie 1 for more information on the Kyogoku. Before researching for this video, I was under the impression that the second Bleach movie, The Diamond Dust Rebellion, was disliked by the majority of Bleach fans but apparently a few people really enjoyed this movie and even believe it to be better than Memories of Nobody. Is this movie as bad as I remember it to be? Let's check out the story told and look at the pros and cons of this movie and if it improves upon the flaws of the first Bleach movie. Bleach Movie 2 was released on December 22nd, 2007. Its theatrical run began in Japanese cinemas while episode 153 aired on TV that same week. The story of this movie revolves around Toshiro Hitsugaya and the mystery behind the ownership of his Zanbakdo. Let's briefly go over the events that take place during this movie before analysing the pros and cons of this movie. 
Squad 10 and their captain Toshiro Hitsugaya, along with his lieutenant Matsumoto Rangiku, are ordered to escort a sacred item called the King Seal. While the rare item is being transported, the carriage carrying the King Seal is attacked. During the attack, the King Seal is stolen by a rogue Shinigami called Sojiro Kusaga. He is assisted by his accomplices, who are two girls called Yin and Yang. Hitsugaya, who recognizes the Shinigami Kusaga, decides to pursue him. He abandons his squad and Rangiku as he looks back at her with a face of sadness before leaving to chase after Kusaga. Rangiku is abandoned and hears of the casualties from the attack. The Soul Society deem Hitsugaya to be a traitor and place his whole squad in isolation within the Squad 10 barracks. Ichigo in the human world comes across an area which is sealed off by a wall. Frustrated that somebody may be up to no good near his home, he breaks through the seal and he sees the casualties from the recent attack. Ichigo encounters Captain Soifon who informs him about what occurred. She also tells Ichigo to report to her if he knows anything about Hitsugaya's whereabouts. Uryu joins Ichigo as Soifon leaves with her squad. They try to make sense of what is happening as it begins to snow. Uryu realises that Hitsugaya must have been concealing his Ryatsu to be in hiding. Suddenly, a worn out Hitsugaya appears and collapses in front of them. Ichigo takes Hitsugaya into Kurosaki Clinic so that he can recover his strength. Hitsugaya dreams of his days at the Shinigami Academy as he sees Kusaka compliment him as the boy genius who is consistently scoring well in his classes. He dreams about how they train together back at the academy and is awoken as he hears Kusaka ask him if the two of them are friends. Ichigo who is concerned about Hitsugaya checks up on him and advises him to rest as he will call Orihime to check up on his wounds in the morning. But the following morning Hitsugaya sneaks out of Kurosaki clinic but Ichigo confronts him and asks him why he is behaving like he has something to hide. Ichigo tries to offer to help Hitsugaya with whatever it is that is bothering him but he denies that there's something going on. But Ichigo asks if he is concerned because of Kusaka which prompts Hitsugaya to be surprised by the mention of that name. Ichigo assumes that it was Kusaka who attacked and stole the King's seal, but Hitsugaya states that Kusaka is someone who was murdered a long time ago. Ichigo asks who killed Kusaka, but Hitsugaya ignores the question and continues to walk away. When Ichigo tries to stop Hitsugaya, he attacks him. The two of them are then attacked by Kusaka's subordinates, Yin and Yang. They have come to take Hitsugaya with them. Ichigo tries to not let them take him, but Hitsugaya attacks Ichigo and tells him to let him go with them. The three of them overpower Ichigo by attacking him one after the other. They leave while Ichigo, covered in blood, shouts out, asking where he is going before collapsing. He is later woken up by Rukia and Renji. He tells them about how Hitsugaya left with two girls who resembled Arankas, also informing him that Itsugaya mentioned he needs to get the king's seal back from someone called Kusaka. Ichigo tells them that he also mentioned that Kusaka had died a long time ago. Renji then returns to the Soul Society to learn more about this mysterious individual called Kusaka. In a flashback, we learn that Hitsugaya and Kusaka are standing in front of the Central 46, who declare that there can only be one owner of Hyorimaru, as there cannot be two Shinigami who possess the same Zanpakuto. There has always been one rightful owner for each Zanpakuto. Hitsugaya attempts to resolve the dilemma by stating he will relinquish ownership of Hyorimaru, but the Central 46 states that this is not his decision to make, alluding to the two of them having to face off against each other to the death to decide the rightful owner of the Zanpakuto. Back in the present day, Ichigo and the others try to investigate Hitsugaya's connection to Kusaka, but keep coming up with dead ends. Primarily due to Hitsugaya not speaking about his past and not having really opened up with anyone, including his own lieutenant Rangiku, she tells Renji she has never heard the name Kusaka before. Renji hands over Hitsugaya's captain coat to Rangiku, telling her that he left it at Ichigo's house. Rangiku, noticing there is blood on Hitsugaya's coat, realizes that he must be hurt. Rangiku is unsure whether to feel happy that Hitsugaya is still alive or upset because he has abandoned everybody. Back in the past, we see Kusaka obtaining the Zanpakuto Hyoremaru. An overjoyed Kusaka tells Hitsugaya that it is amazing that they both have the same power. In present time, Captain Shunsui and his Lieutenant Nanao look through the library to find any records of Kusaka, but they find nothing. They do, however, note that there is a student who is missing from the class that Hitsugaya graduated from. They learn that this missing student is from Northern Rukongai and is named Sojura Kusaka. However, this person person is confirmed to have died. As Captain Shunsui leaves the library for a walk, he is confronted by Kusaka, who battles with the captain. Meanwhile, in the human world, Hitsugaya is confronted by a group of Shinigami led by the two lieutenants Kira and Hisagi. They order Hitsugaya to return to the Soul Society, but he has no intention of returning. They battle with Hitsugaya to try and subdue him and escort him back. They plea with him to not fight back as he will be accused of treason. Hitsugaya resists and attacks the Shinigami with his Bankai, Daiguren Hyorimaru. Back in the 
Kurite, Shunsui is left injured after his battle with Kusaka, his wounds attended to by Captain Unohana and Squad 4. The rest of the Shinigami learn of Hitsugai's actions after he badly injured Hisagi and Kira. They are shocked that he would hurt his own comrades that were on his side not too long ago. The next day in the Soul Society, Head Captain Yamamoto declares in the captain's meeting that capturing Hitsugaya is top priority and that he now has an execution order placed on him. Ichigo in the human world learns of this news and is confused as to why such an order would be issued. Byakuya along with Mayuri question how Hyoremaru could have attacked Captain Shunsui in the Soul Society and Lieutenants Kira and Hisagi in the human world at the same time. Mayuri begins researching the possibility of twin Zanpakuto existing. He begins to look into the historical library of the Soul Society. Another flashback reveals that the Central 46 ordered Hitsugaya and Kusaka to battle to the death to determine the rightful owner of Hyorimaru. During their battle, they are interrupted by the Kagan, who are the elite assassins from the Stealth Division. They reveal that the Central 46 has declared Hitsugaya as the rightful owner of Hyorimaru, proceeding to then restrain Hitsugaya as they run their blades through Kusaka. He starts panting while in his final moments he recalls how he devoted his entire life to the Soul Society, to then be betrayed by them in the end. Hyorimaru fades from Kusaka's hands as he dies. Back in the present day, Ichigo is attacked by Kusaka and his allies, and he is shown how Kusaka was murdered and learns of his past with Hitsugaya. Ichigo relates to Hitsugaya as he too felt his view of the world change after losing his mother. He assumes Hitsugaya must have similarly been affected by the death of Kusaka. It is clear that both of them built up emotions within themselves so as to not burden the people around them. Ichigo realises that when he bottled up his emotions, he was in fact causing those around him to worry and feel concerned for his well-being. Ichigo remembering the desperate look on Hitsugaya's face realises it was like the look he had back when his mother died. Hitsugaya is entirely shouldering the burden of Kusaka's death. He feels responsible for it. Ichigo now understands why Hitsugaya has been behaving irrationally and pushing everyone away. Kusaka gets away as Ichigo is left to battle the female Arankas. Meanwhile, we see that Hitsugaya finally confronts Kusaka, asking him to return the King's Seal, but Kusaka intends to use it to exact his plan. The King's Seal begins glowing as it pulls Hitsugaya towards Kusaka, as the two of them are teleported away. Rukia and Ichigo can sense an incredible surge of Reatsu. The Aranka girls Yin and Yang reveal it is the power of the King's Seal, stating that Hitsugaya and Kusaga have begun their vengeful plan against the Soul Society. Hitsugaya and Kusaka appear on Sokyoku Hill with the increasing Reatsu of the King's Seal alerting the Soul Society to their location. The Shinigami prepare for battle. Kusaka tells Hitsugaya of the power of the King's Seal, about how it can manipulate time and space via teleportation, thus explaining how Kusaka is alive, as he is able to undo his wounds or injuries by returning to a form before he sustained the injuries. The Shinigami then arrive and begin battling with Kusaka, while in the human world, Chad and Uryu battle Yin and Yang, allowing Ichigo and Rukia to head to the Soul Society. Back in Sokyoku Hill, the Shinigami are about to clash with Hitsugaya and Kusaka, but before they can fight, they are stopped by a Gatsuka Tencho from Ichigo. Head Captain Yamamoto also arrives and states that the King's Seal brought Kusaka back to life and resurrected him into Huekomundo. Kusaka confirms this and reveals his plan to become the King of the Soul Society. Hitsugaya then attacks Kusaka, revealing it was never his intention to be his accomplice, much to his surprise. Everyone is confused and wonders why Hitsugaya abandoned everyone if he didn't intend to betray the Gotai 13. Ichigo and Rukia explain that Hitsugaya feels responsible for everything and could not deal with having to kill Kusaka again. His emotions led him to pursue Kusaka and abandon his post, resulting in him being branded as a traitor. Kusaka rejects Hitsugaya's help and cuts the King's Seal in half. Ichigo arrives and snaps him back into his senses by persuading Hitsugaya to let everyone help him and to not shoulder the burden of responsibility on his own. Preparing to fight, they watch as the dust settles and Kusaka appears in a new form as an iced dragon. The Aranka girls also arrive beaten and beg for Kusaka's forgiveness, but he traps them both in ice. He then begins gaining more power as the King's Seal releases more Reatsu, going out of control. Mayuri comments that if this continues, then the Serite will be destroyed. The Aranka girls have now been transformed into large hollows as they keep the B-side company, while the A-side, which includes Rukia, Ichigo and Hitsugaya, head for Kusaka, who is located at the top of his stone tower he has just created. Hollows block their path, but with the help of Renji, Byakuya, Ikaku and the others, they fend them off. Yamamoto, Komamura and Mayuri are all holding back the expansion of the Reatsu Dome formed by the King's Seal, while both Hitsugaya and Ichigo make their way to the tower where Kusaka is located. As they reach the top, Ichigo and Hitsugaya begin to battle 
battle Kusaka. Ichigo stabs Kusaka and then fires a Getsuka Tensho through his head. The rest of Kusaka's body shatters as everything begins to return to normal. As the dust clears, a breathless Kusaka emerges. Ichigo respectfully tells Hitsugaya to take care of the rest. They both charge towards each other and clash one last time. As Kusaka's blade shatters, he admits that Hitsugaya is the rightful owner of Yorimaru. His body begins to disappear as Hitsugaya tells him they will always be friends. The King Seal reforms and drops to the ground. Ichigo hands the King Seal to Hitsugaya as he consoles him. As the movie wraps up, Hitsugaya places Kusaka's broken Zanpakuto on his grave as he says farewell to his friend. After re-watching this movie, I can only say that I was expecting more from a movie centred around Hitsugaya, who is easily one of the most popular characters within Bleach. This movie just feels lacklustre, from how Ichigo abruptly defeats Kusaka to how Kusaka's motivation feels rather contrived and unconvincing. He randomly just states towards the end of the movie he wants to become the king of the Soul Society. It probably would have made more sense if this goal was stated in the beginning. It would have been more in line with his desire for revenge. Even so, a more convincing goal like taking out the Central 46 would have made more sense as they were responsible for his death. The plot of this movie centres around the concept that no two individuals may wield the same Zanpak Do. The Central 46 enforce this rule without any real reason as to why. Just simply fate has determined it to be so. In general, from what I have seen online, this movie is enjoyed by a lot of fans, and I can relate to some extent, but overall, Diamond Dust Rebellion leaves much more to be desired. The second Bleach movie falls short in several areas, the most notable being its plot that it is trying to tell. We get to experience Hitsugaya's past, as well as seeing his days spent studying at the academy. Aside from this, all we have left is a generic plot centred around revenge. Kusaka is magically brought back to life through the King's Seal, but we have no idea of knowing if this was purposeful or a mere coincidence. Kusaka somehow now understands the power of the King's Seal and knows the exact day that the seal was changing location. It is established that the relocating of the King's Seal is a highly confidential mission, which only a limited number of people know about. Just how on earth was Kusaka aware that the seal was being transported on that day? This is the first of many plot threads which are not explained within the movie. The next unexplained mystery is why Hitsugaya runs away immediately after everything occurs. I understand seeing Kusaka must have been a shock to him, but he just leaves. Considering he is a captain, you would assume it wouldn't have taken him long to catch up to Kusaka, but Hitsugaya just runs away. He gives no explanation, he exhibits none of the traits of an honourable and well-respected captain. He literally bails on everyone, but in actual fact we quickly learn that he didn't run away. He was just hiding right next to where the ambush just took place. So this then leads directly to head captain Yamamoto who makes the first of his very irrational decisions. He deems Hitsugaya to be a traitor and commands that squad 10 are confined within their housing. He has no faith in Hitsugaya who holds the well-respected position of a captain. No benefit of the doubt is given, he is declared not to be trusted due to breaking the rules and not following orders. The head captain even goes as far as to threaten shutting down the whole of squad 10, which seems a bit overkill if you ask me. Squad 10 didn't really break any rules or disobey any orders. Seems like a stretch to punish them in all fairness. From this moment on, the movie turns Hitsugaya into the most unlikable version of himself. I've yet to see a character go full 180 to the extent that Hitsugaya did in this movie. So he makes his second getaway during the crack of dawn as he runs away from Kurosaki Clinic. Ichigo spots him as he is shoehorned into the story as the voice of reason for Hitsugaya. Unlike head captain Yamamoto, Ichigo is willing to give absolutely everyone the benefit of the doubt. In the most confusing moment of the whole movie, Hitsugaya teams up with the two Aranka girls and attacks Ichigo before leaving with them. So who even are these two weird Aranka girls? We never see how Kusaka met them, nor is their motivation to help Kusaka explained. They are just there and helping Kusaka for no apparent reason at all. I have no idea where Hitsugaya goes with these Aranka girls, but he doesn't meet Kusaka. The next time we see them, we see the girls speaking to Kusaka and Hitsugaya on his own daydreaming about his past. If someone wants to explain how on earth Hitsugaya ended up in an abandoned factory and not led to Kusaka, I'd be rather grateful. The single most unforgivable scene also plays out in this movie, when none other than Captain Shunsui heads out for a breather and is confronted by Kusaka, who proceeds to off-screen bitch slap Shunsui so hard it leaves him struggling to breathe. Even if he was surprised that Kusaka removed his mask revealing his true identity, I don't think it would have made Shunsui forget his hundreds of years worth of training. Shunsui pretty much just read about Kusaka being some dude that died a long time ago. Would he really be that shocked to discover he is alive, causing him to forget how to hold a sword? Even with the King's Seal in Kusaka's possession, it wasn't even activated at that point. Power scaling clearly was thrown out the window during this movie. I mentioned earlier that Ichigo was shoehorned 
shoehorned into the story before, well, I will never understand why he delivered the final blow to Kusaka. So if we examine the final blow, how did Ichigo one-shot kill Kusaka, who was an ice dragon god who obtained the power of the king's seal, which he never utilised beyond constructing a nice tower to stand on top of? The final confrontation did need to be longer, but with such a predictable plot, I can't say that the issue lies with the end fight. The problem began when Hitsugai decided to run away and hide within 10 minutes of the movie opening, and the Aronkar girls turning up for god knows whatever reason. I think it is pretty obvious now that the story was poorly executed at this point. The movie, like the first Bleach movie, also suffers from including way too many characters who don't need to be there. I once again didn't see the point of Uryu, Chad and Orihime in this movie. The only major involvement was from Chad and Uryu, who had a fight with the Aronkar girls, and in all honesty, why are they even here? What What is their purpose again? Also, Yuriichi is never mentioned in the movie, nor do we see Urahara, but magically during the final fight we hear a Shunko out of nowhere and she appears. Also, if they were going to have a movie about Hitsugaya, I'm confused as to why they didn't commit fully to this idea. Instead, we have Ichigo shoehorned into the movie, his involvement felt very forced and unnatural. I think the story would have been improved if Ichigo remained as a supporting role. Despite that long rant about the cons of this movie, I must say that the art and animation is as incredible as ever. The battle sequences are enjoyable to watch if you're not trying to work out the logic behind the sword swings. So the movie did kind of redeem itself during the final battle sequence, which involves everyone once again, and some of the captains get some great screen time like Kimpachi and Byakuya. The soundtrack from the anime also features within the movie along with some newly composed pieces just for this movie. When I first heard about the idea of a movie centred around Hitsugaya and his past, I found it to be a very interesting concept, but ultimately it was executed very poorly. Even the title of the movie makes no sense or holds no meaning. Diamond Dust Rebellion makes it sound like a cool iced out rebellious battle, but all we got was Hitsugaya running away and hiding, and Kusaka who was accompanied by two random girls he found in Huekamundo, trying to have his cliched revenge plot unfold. In all honesty, this movie felt more like the Diamond Dust disappointment. It definitely had potential and could have been an insightful story about the past of Hitsugaya, but instead it ends up telling a very unoriginal plot which has more holes than you can count. The concept of twin Zambakdo was interesting, but even upon analysis, how do two people obtain the same Zambakdo when the essence of the Zambakdo is generated by each person's unique individual spirit? Hitsugaya in the manga is a voice of reason, especially to characters like Momo, but in this movie he is nothing like his level-headed composed self. He, like the other captains, has a very distinct and well-defined personality, which makes him a joy to follow in the original source material. This movie just failed to translate the likeable traits of Hitsugaya onto the big screen. If you do want to just zone out and watch 90 minutes of great Bleach animation, then this movie is for you. But if you desire a rich, fleshed out story, then look elsewhere. Fate to Black Bleach is the third movie based on the very popular manga and anime series Bleach. The first movie was centred around the movie exclusive character called Senna. The second was Hitsugaya, and this third movie revolves its plot around Rukia. Let's see how this third character centred movie compares to its predecessors. Is this another cliche, forgettable movie, or will calling back to the memories of Rukia in the series pull on your heartstrings enough to win you over? Movie 3 was released in Japan on December 13th, 2008, while Bleach episode 198 aired on TV that week, directed by Noriyuki Abe. This movie tells a story about how the memory of Rukia fades away from the Shinigami. This movie does recycle story beats from the previous movies, and even causes you to feel deja vu as moments from the anime are repeated, and we get to see old feuds reignited for the big screen. Fate to Black tells a story about a pair of siblings who disrupt the order within the Soul Society so that they can kidnap Rukia. This movie begins with a pair attacking Mayuri, cutting him with a scythe which makes him forget his memories. Mayuri, who has now forgotten every everything panics and damages his machines, which causes a large explosion to erupt from his research facility. Rukia is then attacked by the mysterious duo, as she falls victim to the same scythe that cut Mayuri. This causes everyone to forget about Rukia's existence, as well as Rukia's own memories being entirely erased. This is a very interesting premise and definitely a stronger opening than the previous two movies. In Karakura Town, it appears that Ichigo has forgotten Rukia. That is until Kon, who happens to be the only one who has not forgotten her, reminds him. Ichigo visits 
visits Urahara, who appears to have forgotten both Ichigo and Rukia, and doesn't recall anyone called Rukia, aside from confirming he has records of someone going by that name who frequently purchased items from his store. He then tries his luck at the Soul Society. Ichigo and Kun both arrive to learn that nobody recognizes who Ichigo is, and they treat him like an enemy. Frustratingly, once again, he is an intruder to the Soul Society. Yes, this is another movie where Ichigo and the Soul Society are at odds with each other. In every movie so far, this has been a recurring theme. And it's not just this, you can see that many elements are borrowed from the anime and manga to tell these movie exclusive stories, recreating aspects of the Soul Society arc as well as mentions of Hueco Mundo and its involvement are some of the repeated or borrowed elements within this movie. Returning to Rukia, we see that she has been taken to the Rukon district. She is kept company by the brother and sister pair who kidnapped her. Reassuringly, she does remember that she grew up in the Rukon district. The siblings try to remind Rukia that they used to know each other a long time ago, and she even named them. Rukia doesn't recall any of this, and even states she doesn't remember the names that she called them. Meanwhile, Ichigo continues to struggle against the Shinigami. He meets Byakuya and attempts to remind him that Rukia was Hisano's sister, but he is interrupted and battles Renji, which results in some cool flashbacks to occur that call back to their first encounter within the Soul Society arc. I really like this confrontation between the two of them. The placement of the music, the intensity of Renji, and the animation which brings this fight to life. Their stubborn attitudes and determination is what made their feud within the manga feel so enjoyable. Thanks to the plot of the movie, we get another chance to see them battle, but this time Ichigo doesn't waste any time as he activates his Bankai. He taunts Renji to activate his Bankai, but he doesn't remember having one. This is a great scene, as Ichigo says to Renji that he developed his Bankai so that he could save Rukia. Without any memories of Rukia, he cannot remember ever attaining it. I thought this was a nice addition to the movie. Ichigo raises his blade in the air, with the resolve to make Renji remember, which causes Renji to have a flashback to how he did the exact same stance when they fought in the Soul Society arc. Just when the battle was getting good, Byakuya sadly stops the fight, as he helps Ichigo by directing him to the birthplace of his wife, Hisana, hoping Ichigo may learn more about Rukia if he goes there. This action reveals that Byakuya does have a softer side to him, as he helps Ichigo by giving him information about Rukia's possible whereabouts. It's a great contrast, especially if you compare this to his behaviour towards Ichigo in the Soul Society arc. Ichigo arrives in the Rukon district, where he finds Rukia and tries to remind her about her forgotten memories, but to no avail. The siblings can see that Ichigo's efforts to remind Rukia about her memories are distressing her, so they escape with her. We are then updated to the whereabouts of Mayuri, as we see him imprisoned. Surprisingly, Urahara appears out of nowhere to meet Mayuri. He explains how his memories were confused and compares it to losing his own memories of Rukia. Urahara deduces that Mayuri and Rukia were attacked by the same individual. He helps Mayuri by locating his memories that he regularly backed up, which is rather convenient. It does feel strange and out of nowhere to see Urahara appear. It's not given much context, we just see him there and are supposed to accept it, especially if we consider the fact that he is exiled from the Soul Society, but no explanation or attention is given to that fact. The great thing about the Bleach movies is that we experience events and character interactions which never occur in the manga. Urahara meeting Mayuri and helping him is an excellent callback to his days as a captain and the Turn Back the Pendulum arc. The movies provide great fan service for those who want to see more interactions from their favourite characters. We learn that the siblings hold a grudge against the Shinigami, claiming that they took everything away from them, including Rukia. However, Rukia begins to remember flashbacks of her memory after having seen Ichigo earlier. Ichigo and Kon are then confronted by the Gotai 13, who try to attack the two of them. However, Renji defends them and states that he may not remember Ichigo, but his heart is telling him to trust him. Head Captain Yamamoto eventually arrives, accompanied by the other captains. They intend to capture Ichigo. However, out of nowhere, Urahara interrupts them with his old captain attire on, which doesn't make any sense but looks cool regardless. Once again, another callback to the Turn Back the Pendulum arc. Seeing Urahara with his captain attire along with the other captains is so pleasing to see. It may not make any sense, but I can't bring myself to disagree with this fan service. Urahara requests Ichigo and Renji to go and find Rukia, while he explains to the Gotai 13 what he has discovered regarding their memory loss. He begins to describe his studies on a parasitic hollow who has the ability to erase memories with a scythe that is attached to its body. Urahara deduces that it is this hollow that is controlling the two siblings. Rukia is taken with the siblings to Mayuri's lab, where they intend to destroy the Shinigami by tampering with Mayuri's spiritual machine to cause another Reishi explosion. It is pretty evident that these siblings are annoying, especially the girl. Their story just doesn't really make you feel invested or care for them. Personally, the only thing that I really wanted to know was their relationship with Rukia and their past with her, which only confirms that they were only interesting due to their connection to Rukia, who is constantly in their company. It was her memory loss and how she is affected by the events of the movie, which helped me to keep my attention to 
towards the siblings. As I mentioned earlier, the siblings believe that the Shinigami are responsible for Rukia being taken away from them when they were children. Rukia notices that the siblings slip up and she realises that she was a Shinigami prior to forgetting her memories. While Rukia argues with the siblings, Renji and Ichigo begin making their way over to Mayuri's lab. One of my favourite Bankai transformations occurs here. While Ichigo is standing on top of Zabimaru's head, he yells Bankai while absurdly cool explosions occur behind him. This movie just keeps hitting you with over the top action which pays homage to the relationships between the characters. It really is the small things. Ichigo and Renji teaming up is super exciting and is an enjoyable way to begin the final confrontation with the yet to appear main villain of this movie. Rukia refuses to let the siblings hurt the Shinigami as Ichigo and Renji finally arrive. She remembers them and her memories appear to now be restored. This frustrates the female sibling who becomes enraged and causes a fusion of the siblings and Rukia to occur. The result of the fusion is super emo goth dark Rukia. I have to just get this out there, I really like how this form looks, it's really cool, she has a great design and a menacing scythe that she is carrying along with her soulless eyes make her feel like a real threat. This new design along with a changed attitude turns the beloved Rukia into a real monster that has lost a sense of reasoning with Ichigo and the others. It appears that dark Rukia is also holified as she transforms Mayuri's reishi machine into a giant monster. A battle then ensues between Ichigo and dark Rukia. He tries his best to hold back his power so as to not hurt her, but dark Rukia on the other hand is going wild and not holding back at all. Urahara then proposes to the Gotai 13 that they need to destroy the reishi machine within Mayuri's lab so that they can stop the giant hollow from continuing to destroy the soul society. In a pretty hype scene, the head captain along with Kyoraku and Shunsui unleash their Zanpak Do and attack the giant hollow. The newly composed music made for this movie makes the attack on the giant hollow feel more enjoyable and exciting. We then see Yuriichi team up with Siphon and even Urahara involving himself in the battle. Now these are moments which you don't see often within the anime. Kimpachi also makes his obligatory rampage in this movie. It wouldn't feel like a Bleach movie if Kimpachi wasn't laughing and attacking the opposition. Meanwhile, Ichigo frustratingly tries to get Rukia to remember her memories, but she continues attacking senselessly. Byakuya then arrives to Ichigo's aid as the other captains along with Urahara make some progress against the monster. Byakuya binds Dark Rukia as he claims it is his responsibility to stop her, as she is getting out of control and is gradually transforming into a hollow. Ichigo then recalls back to when Rukia saved him and his family. The flashback is very relevant and fits well within the context of this movie. It is this connection between Rukia and Ichigo that forms the foundational beginning of Bleach as a whole. I love how this movie pays respect to it through Rukia losing her memories. We already know her impact on Ichigo's life, but in the movie's finale, we see just how much she means to Ichigo and how she has made an everlasting impression on him. It is for this very reason that Ichigo cannot stand aside and let Byakuya resolve the battle by killing her. This time Ichigo is going to save her as we see Rukia share her powers with him in a dramatic flashback while Ichigo runs his sword through Rukia's chest driving out the parasitic hollow. The logic seems to be that Ichigo sharing his powers with Rukia would restore her which it indeed appears to have done. Rukia returns to normal. She reassuringly recognises Ichigo confirming that her memories have been restored. Meanwhile Byakuya and Renji unleash their Bankai and help in putting a stop to the giant monster as the movie begins to wrap up. The siblings who are responsible for this whole movie's plot lay heavily wounded on the ground as Rukia consoles them. We then see a flashback which provides much needed context to explain why the siblings behaved like they did during the movie. In the flashback we learn that the two siblings were harassed by a Shinigami who had been possessed by a parasitic hollow, the same one that Urahara earlier had mentioned. Rukia comes to their aid but fails to protect them. She falls unconscious as the Shinigami attacks the two siblings. Urahara explains that Rukia had forgotten these events due to the parasitic hollow. The siblings managed to trap the hollow within their body and hide in Huekomundo until they escaped and reunited with Rukia due to their intense desire to return to her. Rukia finally remembers the siblings but unfortunately they both die from their wounds. The movie concludes with Rukia feeling determined to not let the memory of the siblings fade away again as she will remember them from now on. Fate of Black centred around the bond between Rukia and Ichigo and focused on Rukia's memory loss and it proved to be very enjoyable. With the involvement of most of the cast but not needlessly involving Uryu, Chad and Orihime which definitely was an improvement on the prior movies which did that. The characters all seem to get a nice spotlight. Ikaku has a little scrap with Ichigo. The several different captains all have moments to shine during the final battle. Even Byakuya has a small role he plays within the movie as everyone has forgotten Rukia but for Byakuya it wasn't that easy to 
to completely forget Hisana's younger sister. Also, Urahara's involvement, although out of nowhere, is welcomed and fits well within the story of the movie. His interactions with the other captains and their teamwork while battling is satisfying to see. I definitely think they struck the right balance of supporting characters for this movie, especially when compared to the prior Bleach movies. As to be expected for a feature length production, the animation here does not falter. The art and animation in general I felt were improved upon from the prior movies, which were very well done in their own right. The story told in Fate of Black features callbacks to the anime series. When characters remember their memories, we get impactful flashbacks to iconic Bleach episodes. Each one fits within the context of the movie. They are done with enough respect that they don't feel contrived or forced into the story. Without a doubt, this movie has similar elements to the prior Bleach movies, taking the concept of forgotten memories from Memories of Nobody, taking the character-centered plot from Diamond Dust Rebellion but improving upon it. Rukia was the right character to base a movie upon, as their bond with Ichigo drives this movie and fans will easily be able to relate to this due to already knowing the backstory between these two characters, without it having to be shoehorned into the movie's plot like it was with Diamond Dust Rebellion between Hitsugaya and Kusaka. It does have to be said that Movie 3 features the best music from any of the Bleach movies. The soundtrack composed for this movie I first heard while I was watching the anime episodes, and immediately looked up the OST and to my surprise I learned that the music was from the Bleach Movie 3 soundtrack. If you're a fan of Shiro Sagisu's Bleach compositions, then this movie is a must watch. Fate of Black does falter, as with all Bleach movies in some elements when it comes to its plot. Despite being an improvement on the last two movies, some areas of the story just are not explained as well or felt hard to believe. Like the plot device for everyone forgetting Rukia, it fails to establish what criteria are required for her friends to remember her again. Ichigo remembered her after Kon spoke to him. Renji is convinced to team up with Ichigo because his heart is telling him it's the right thing to do. Rukia meets Ichigo after having a couple of scenes where she suffers a headache or a migraine. She remembers everything at the most convenient moment in the plot, before the final fight and her transformation into Dark Rukia. We don't really get any clarification as to why Ichigo remembered quicker than Renji, or why characters like Byakuya didn't remember until Dark Rukia was defeated. Urahara also decides to help Ichigo, which is done convincingly, as Urahara had made journal entries of the plot up until now, and knew something was up when he couldn't recall anything about Rukia, despite her being mentioned in his journal entries. The issue with his involvement is how he convinces the Soul Society to help him. The Gotai 13 agree with Urahara and Yoriichi, who help them to understand why they feel like they have forgotten someone or something. After explaining his theory regarding the parasitic hollow, which seems like a complete guess by Urahara to be honest, they believe and trust him despite Urahara apparently being an exiled traitor. Urahara's explanation to the Gotai 13 is long-winded and hard to believe. He even explains that they forgot Ichigo because his memories are related to Rukia's past, as Ichigo's Soul Reaper powers originated from Rukia, to which Head Captain Yamamoto of course mentions that sharing Shinigami powers is a serious criminal offence, which makes me cringe at how predictable he is. Despite this, like I mentioned earlier, I do like Urahara's involvement, just how he won over the trust of the Soul Society could have been done better. The only other problem I have with this movie is in regards to the siblings, well, one sibling in particular. The female sibling, who is so needy, demanding, and annoying, her constant crying and whining was so off-putting. Due to this, it resulted in her not really feeling like a threatening antagonist. I guess ultimately the villains were a pair of confused siblings who were just set up for the real villain, Dark Rukia, who really stole the show in the end. Overall, this movie did not feel like a poorly written filler arc squeezed into a 90 minute movie. I think that this movie does justice to Rukia's character and succeeds in telling an entertaining story revolving around her. It also features great reminders of iconic bleach moments and heavy emphasis is placed upon the bond between Ichigo and Rukia. The title of the movie, Fate to Black, explains the context of the movie and makes sense as the memory of Rukia is faded into nothingness. Despite having similarities to the previous two movies, Fate to Black improves upon them and really learns from the shortcomings of Diamond Dust Rebellion. Getting to see characters who don't interact much in the anime and seeing them fight together in this movie and exchange meaningful dialogue was exciting to see. If you really love the characters within Bleach and enjoy their witty banter, sarcastic remarks and play for conversations, then you need to watch this movie. Movie 3 features an enjoyable story along with great animation. It expands upon the dynamic between Ichigo and Rukia and tells a new story which feels very reminiscent of the Soul Society arc but with a twist. If you have seen this movie then let me know your thoughts on it. Did you enjoy it or find it not as good as the other movies?
The fourth and final animated movie based on the popular manga series Bleach involves our characters visiting the unexplored realm of Hell. This movie is titled Hellverse or Hell Chapter. It is directed by Noriyuki Abe and features character designs from Masashi Kudo, the same creative team behind the previous movies and the anime series. In this video I want to cover the story told within the movie as well as what the strengths and weaknesses of Bleach's final animated film are. Let's see if it is as good as the other movies. From 2010 onwards, Mangaka began to be more involved with the animated movies based on their series. The first movie I remember where the Mangaka was personally overseeing production was with Ishiro Oda and his involvement with One Piece film Strong World. Following this trend, the creator of Bleach, Taite Kubo, had been announced as overseeing production for the fourth Bleach movie. Once the movie had released, the credit of executive director was given to Kubo, but there was some controversy regarding this, which I will cover later. Helvis released in Japanese theatres on December 4th, 2010 while episode 299 aired on TV. This movie had a few promotional tie-ins, including episode 299, which was a prologue to the movie. Kubo even released a special Hellverse chapter titled Imaginary No. 1, The Unforgivens. The special prologue tells the story of the Espadas Aaron Yaro and Zizel Apollo arriving in Hell. This movie featured a lot more promotion than just simply changing the anime's opening intro to feature some movie scenes, which was the case with the prior three movies. Being a fan at the time, I remember there being a lot of of hype for this movie to release. The concept of Hell was brought up for the first and only time in episode 5 when Ichigo defeated the Hollow called Shrika, who was then sent to Hell when we see the gates of Hell for the first and only time in the series. How these gates were portrayed definitely left an impression on me when I first got into the Bleach anime. Remembering the appearance of them, I can recall how sinister it looked with the skeletons on either side of its doors, as well as the menacing laughter which can be heard as the gates opened to take the Hollow Shrika. It was a brief glimpse into one of the darkest aspects of the Bleach universe and was compelling to see so early on in the series. How is Hell depicted in this fourth movie installment? Is it as sinister as what early Bleach made it out to be? Let's briefly go over the story told in Hellverse and see if it does justice to our expectations of the movie. Hellverse begins with one of the greatest scenes adapted from the Bleach manga. The intro of this movie retells the battle between Ichigo versus Ukiora. Heavy emphasis is placed upon Ichigo transforming into the incredibly powerful Vastolode form. After this really cool intro sequence, we see Renji and Rukia who arrive in the human world to investigate some strange goings on. When Ichigo bumps into them and questions them, neither Rukia or Renji reveal much about what it is that they are investigating. Shortly after, while Ichigo and the others are at school, they are attacked by a group of powerful masked individuals. When one of the strangers' masks breaks during their battle with Ichigo and the others, it causes the gates of hell to appear. A guardian of hell called a Kushinada comes out of the gate to stab this mysterious masked person. The Kushinada drag him back to hell. We learn that the masked men are sinners who usually reside in hell. They cover their faces so as not to be dragged back there. The leader of these masked men is called Shuren. He attempts to kidnap Karin and Yuzu while Ichigo is distracted at school by his underlings. Renji informs him that Rukia is attempting to stop Shuren from taking Ichigo's sisters. Ichigo arrives in time to help Rukia and to stop Shuren, but then a stranger appears called Kokuto, who helps Ichigo by retrieving Karin from Shuren's possession, but they are unable to stop Shuren from leaving with Yuzu, who is taken to hell by her kidnappers. It appears that Shuren and his men require Ichigo's assistance so that they can fulfill their one wish to be released from hell. Kokuto then suggests that he can help Ichigo by showing him the path to hell. Ichigo, accompanied by Uryu, Rukia, and Renji, agrees to Kokuto's offer of help. We learn that Kokuto is also from hell, so what are his reasons to help Ichigo and the others? Ichigo's primary concern is that if Yuzu is not saved from hell, then she will die there, due to its incredibly poisonous atmosphere. Rukia and Renji are the only ones among our familiar cast of characters who know what hell actually entails. Tales. It is described as a place where souls go to when they are not given permission to cross over to the Soul Society. This happens when a person has committed unforgivable acts during their lifetime. We learn that the dwellers of hell are bound by chains, unable to ever escape their eternal fate. This description alone was a great way to build up the anticipation to finally get to see hell, and experience how it is depicted within the Bleach universe. Kokuto also explains that he is helping them because he doesn't like Shuren and his allies, and for that reason they are his enemies. It seems rather convincing, right? Rukia, however, questions him and asks what he did to become a sinner himself. He replies by saying that he sold his heart to darkness during his lifetime so that he could protect what he cherishes. I guess we should just accept this as his answer and totally trust this guy. Renji also speaks some sense and questions how they can just trust Kokuto, as he could be anyone, but Ichigo insists he will accept anybody's help as long as they can help him to save Yuzu. Despite all of the caution and apprehension, Ichigo's two seconds of shonen headstrong attitude convinces every 
everyone to go along with Kokuto's offer of help. I guess we know who to blame if something were to hypothetically go wrong later on. It is reassuring to hear Rukia tell Renji about a sort of plan to emergency escape from hell if things were to go wrong. Not saying that they will, but you never know who you can trust. Arriving in hell, they rush through to get to Yuzu as quickly as possible, while battling one of the many Kushinada who try to capture them. While Ichigo is fighting them off, his hollow mask appears without him summoning it. He unleashes a incredibly powerful Getsuka Tensho, which causes the others to scold him, as he could have hurt them with the amount of power that was released. Ichigo is surprised by this until Kokuto explains that in hell an individual's true power is easier to harness, hence why Ichigo lost control and his mask appeared without him summoning it. Kokuto also explains that if the Kushinada catch any of them then they will be trapped within hell for eternity and will be subjected to torture by the Kushinada. They consume sinners who are killed and then are forced to be reborn into the lower level of hell, where if they are caught again then they will be consumed once more as the cycle of death and rebirth repeats endlessly, until their willpower is non-existent and their physical body reduces to dust. Shuren's underlings make another appearance as the group makes progress by going deeper into hell's different layers. Renji, Rukia and Uryu keep them occupied while Kokuto and Ichigo progress further to where Shuren is located with Yuzu. While on their way there, Kokuto and Ichigo have a little heart to heart as Kokuto recovers from an injury he just sustained. Kokuto refuses Ichigo's pity or help as he states that experiencing pain is normal within hell. You do feel feel somewhat sorry for him. Despite being in pain, he insists that Ichigo focuses his energy on saving his sister. Ichigo learns that Kokuto is concerned about his sister because of what Kokuto mentioned earlier, about selling his soul to darkness to protect what he cherishes. Ichigo assumes that this someone he cherished was related to him. Kokuto reveals he too had a younger sister once, but she died due to Kokuto being an irresponsible older brother. Kokuto then makes Ichigo promise to him that he will save his sister. I guess this guy isn't so bad anymore, I can totally see myself wholeheartedly trusting him. I mean, he had a younger sister too, he knows how it feels like. He can't be that bad, even if he is a dweller of hell, I presume. Back to Renji and the others, they systematically defeat Shuren's minions one by one. Meanwhile, Kokuto requests that after they save Yuzu, if Ichigo could break his chains of hell, so that he can go back and apologise to his sister. Ichigo agrees to help him to be freed from hell. I guess if Ichigo is convinced to trust Kokuto, then who am I to doubt him? But wait, how does Kokuto know Ichigo has a power that can break the chains of hell? He asked Ichigo for his help before Shuren even had a chance to explain how Ichigo could help them to be freed from hell. This is very suspicious. Finally arriving in front of Shuren, he demands that Ichigo destroys the gates of hell, believing it will save the sinners. He blackmails him, saying he won't hand Yuzu over until he does as he says. Refusing to accept his terms, Ichigo battles Shuren and his men, along with Kokuto. Kokuto sacrifices himself to defeat Shuren's minions. So he turned out to be a great guy who could have been trusted from the beginning of the movie. I feel so bad for doubting him now. Ichigo then becomes enraged and defeats Shuren through using his hollow mask, which amplifies his power within hell. Before being defeated, Shuren explains that it is Ichigo's hollow powers which can destroy the gates of hell. Then in a shocking turn of events, as Ichigo is about to rush towards Yuzu, he is impaled through the chest by Kokuto's blade. Yeah, I was totally being sarcastic about Kokuto being trustworthy. This was the most obvious plot twist in the history of plot twists. I mean, how are you going to trust a guy who lives in hell without being stabbed in the back? So finally, the cat is out of the bag as it is revealed that Kokuto lured Ichigo into hell so that he could use Ichigo's hollow abilities to break the chains that are bound to his body, keeping him in hell. I mean, why did he do this if Ichigo agreed to help him break his chains as long as Yuzu was saved? Let's see what he has to say for himself. I shall sure hope it isn't anything cliche. Kokuto proceeds to spout out cliche backstabbing villain dialogue. He explains that Ichigo now needs to holify to help him out as he promised. We learn that Kokuto did indeed have a sister. He murdered the people responsible for the death of his sister, but it didn't bring his sister back to life, no matter how much he had hoped that it would have. He then decided to make others experience the same pain he was going through as a form of revenge. I don't understand completely what he means here. Did he become a murderer and kill others senselessly, hoping that their relatives could feel the same pain as he does? Or was he sent to hell because he murdered the people responsible for the killing of his sister? I suppose either way he is in hell for murdering people. He continues to explain that one day he saw Ichigo as a vast lorde battling Ukiora through the barriers of hell, and learned that his power could be used to free him from hell. It was at this point in the movie where the story took a huge nosedive for me. I mean, how convenient was it that he just so happened to see Ichigo 
in Hueco Mundo and knew he was in Karakura Town. The movie doesn't fit into the continuity of the series. There is no way for the events of this movie to occur between Ichigo vs Ukiora leading up to the fake Karakura Town arc. It's difficult to believe what is going on because they linked back the plot of this movie to the plot of the series. This just really ruined it for me. He continues on to anger Ichigo by telling him that Yuzu has died within hell, thus making her a sinner and doomed to be binded to hell via the chains on her chest. Rukia, Renji and Uryu eventually arrive to help Ichigo but they are defeated by Kokuto. Ichigo who is enraged by the situation transforms into a Vasto Lorde and attacks Kokuto with a blast which destroys most of his chains along with being powerful enough to actually damage the gates of hell. Renji then breaks Ichigo's hollow mask which returns him back to normal and activates a technique which transports Ichigo and his sister out of hell but at the cost of leaving everyone else behind. The Gotai 13 have arrived in the world of the living as they try to restore the gates of hell which appear to have been damaged by hollow Ichigo. Finally appearing back in the human world, Ichigo frantically tries to get help for Yuzu but even Orihime is unable to remove the bindings of hell from her body. Head Captain Yamamoto sternly tells Ichigo that it was his responsibility to save her and he failed. He scolds Ichigo by stating how irresponsible he was to go to hell without any authorization and he didn't achieve anything but make the situation worse than what it was. The head captain is referring to the broken gates of hell releasing their poisonous atmosphere into the human world now. As if Ichigo didn't have enough reasons to be devastated, the head captain is literally kicking him while he is down. Of course he feels bad about putting the human world in danger as well as not being able to save his sister Yuzu. While Ichigo is sat with a lifeless Yuzu, Byakuya arrives to speak with Ichigo. This is a great interaction between the two of them as Byakuya questions why he won't look at him while he is speaking to him. Ichigo understandably cannot face him while knowing he left Renji, Rukia and Uryu behind in hell. Their sacrifice appears to have been in vain as it was too late for Yuzu. Byakuya reminds him that he needs to consider the meaning of why they stayed behind to let him escape. Just as he says this, Yuzu remarkably makes a recovery as a body begins to levitate in the air and the chains of hell on her body disappear. I don't understand how this happens nor is it explained, just Yuzu is brought back to life. Maybe they wanted to get on with the next act and save the others trapped in hell already. Yuzu is healed and brought back to Kurosaki Clinic where Ichigo sits and contemplates on Byakuya's words. I really love the colour palette during this scene, I mean the intense emotions on Ichigo's face, you can really see just how much he is lost in thought. It honestly is one of my favourite scenes in Bleach, it just embodies the character of Ichigo, someone who persistently protects and cares for others and doesn't rest until his loved ones are brought to safety. So after taking his sweet time, Ichigo finally heads back to hell. He uses a Kushinada who is poking his head out of the gates as a distraction to slip by the Shinigami who are guarding the gates of hell. He flies past all the levels of hell and arrives exactly where his friends are. He sees that Renji and Uryu's bodies are rotting away in hell while Rukia has already been reborn as a sinner. This is really brutal and so hard to see. Rukia is covered in the chains of hell. Reassuringly we know that Ichigo can break hell's chains with the hollow powers so it doesn't really raise the stakes during this final battle. However, seeing Rukia being reborn from burning hot lava and the decomposing bodies of Renji and Uryu felt pretty graphic for a shonen movie. Ichigo then begins to battle Kokuto who appears to be fighting with the upper hand as he taunts Ichigo to use his hollow powers as without them he cannot defeat him. So Ichigo gets knocked around and badly beaten by this overpowered sinner. We don't really know why he is so strong and how he was able to defeat Rukia, Renji and Uryu three against one. And how on earth is he absolutely schooling Bankai Ichigo? Ichigo stops himself from holifying as the Kushinada sends Ichigo's incredible release of Reatsu and walk towards him. Suddenly in the tenth plot twist in this movie we see that the Kushinada have lent their power to Ichigo, revealing a new movie exclusive form. A skull clad Ichigo appears and brings down Renji and Uryu from where they were hanging, while also bringing Rukia back to safety. He also instantly removes the chains of hell from Rukia, Renji and Uryu, while Kokuto wonders like us what on earth has happened to Ichigo. He begins to explain that hell itself has requested for Ichigo's help to stop Kokuto. He attacks Kokuto which momentarily destroys his chains as he celebrates, but then a sea of chains binds him as Ichigo passes righteous judgement down upon him like some sort of god. He condemns Kokuto to punishment for all eternity to repent for his sins that he has committed. I felt that this was a really rushed ending to the movie. It was all over the place, containing so many loose threads that it conveniently wrapped up just before the 90 minute mark of the movie was hit. So everyone appears to have returned to normal as the Kushinada begin to chase after them again. They all run out of hell while the credit song plays and finally arrive back to the world of the living, with Orihime and the Gotai 13 watching as they return. I always thought that this movie was somewhat unfinished, quite possibly because of the scenes that played while the credits rolled, which I'm pretty convinced were not properly animated due to not fitting the runtime of the movie. This is all due to the 
the movie juggling too many villains with a total of two rescue attempts and a rushed ending to wrap up all of the plot points before the 90 minute mark hits. Personally, it just resulted in it feeling very disappointing. At the beginning of this video, I mentioned that Taito Kubo was given the title of executive director of this movie. So what exactly happened? If he was overseeing this movie, how did it turn out to be less than satisfactory? Apparently, there was some controversy regarding his involvement. According to the initial anime news network article, which announced Helvis, we were under the impression that the series author Taiti Kubo would have a very involved role for this movie. However, with the Japanese DVD release of Helvis, a message from Kubo was included. Here is what Kubo had to say in regards to Bleach Movie 4 Helvis. In this movie, I was credited as executive director. However, honestly speaking, for the DVD version, I want that title to be removed. I already asked them to do so. This is because I feel I didn't participate enough in the production of this movie to warrant such a title. I had felt this way since the premiere of the theatrical version. However, when I met with the producer staff to persuade them, the movie was already in the editing process, so it couldn't be removed. I had a meeting with the scriptwriter, I think it was in the year preceding the movie's premiere, in early summer. The meeting was incandescent, and we discussed ideas until nearly dawn. The scriptwriter took careful notes of the ideas that I had contributed jointly during our meeting. The result of the meeting was that we were able to come up with some very interesting ideas. I had the feeling that before winter, at the latest, this scenario for the movie would be completed, but in the end this scenario was only sent to me in the spring of the next year, the same year as the premiere of the movie. Furthermore, the scenario didn't contain any of the ideas from the meeting that we had. Apparently the notes taken from that time were not forwarded on to the director and to the other members of the staff. Later on we had some trouble with the production department agreeing to some of the script changes made by the scriptwriter. The scriptwriter had worked hard with the changes that were made but unfortunately there was no more time for further adjustments. The fact that characters that first made their entry in the original work like Ichigo, Kokuto and Shuren had a very bleach like feeling is all thanks to the voice actors who gave them their voices and to all of the the staff that drew them. Prior to making this video, I knew Kubo wanted his name removed as the executive director, but I didn't know the reason as to why. This is explained entirely why Kubo didn't want his name associated with this movie. Rightfully so, as he states none of the ideas he discussed with the scriptwriter were communicated onto the team. I don't understand what they were thinking. They got Kubo involved, but went on and did whatever they wanted anyway, and proceeded to promote the movie as a production that had close involvement from Kubo himself. I remember thinking that if the original series author was going to be involved, then it will be a movie which is a cut above the rest. But unfortunately, it had so many plot holes. From Kubo's comments, it is evident that the production indeed didn't have enough time to include script rewrites and additional changes which were needed to make the movie feel maybe more coherent. After watching this movie recently, it is evident that something feels off and not right about Hellverse. Just look at the inclusion of the two antagonists, Shirin and Kokuto. Neither of them are given the right amount of time to develop an interesting story around them. Especially in regards to Shirin, who we know absolutely nothing about. He is a very generic filler character. This movie was very ambitious. You can see that there was an attempt to really engage fans by trying to fit this movie within the continuity of the series, but it just doesn't make any sense. If they included Kubo's original ideas, then the story of the movie may have done well to fit within the continuity of the manga. The story of this movie really does feel like way too many ideas crammed into a short amount of time. It results in the movie feeling rushed and not providing enough exposition and dialogue for some scenes, and it makes me further believe that there may have been cuts made to fit the story within the specified runtime of the movie. I mentioned previously that Kokuto as a character had a few flaws that made me wish that they had taken more time to write his character a bit better. Instead it feels like he was forcefully trying to gain the trust of Ichigo and the others, especially in moments like when he made Ichigo promise to save Yuzu. It just felt so unneeded and generic, almost like he was saying nice things just to appear as though he didn't have ulterior motives. It felt to me that he was trying a little too hard to relate to Ichigo's ordeal. The plot twist where it reveals that he is a villain was honestly like watching a train wreck in front of you. How the music drops, the dramatic scene composition, and the shock on Ichigo's face. It is funny because you can see they really wanted you to feel a sense of betrayal and suspense, but it is so hard to feel this when it was so predictable. What I did enjoy about this movie was the beginning portion of it. It was enjoyable to see Ichigo and the others battle in Karakura Town, also seeing the build up to what was leading up to be an interesting plot until they really dropped the ball and didn't properly develop the characters, or continue to make the story feel captivated 
captivating. In terms of art and animation, it is without a doubt that this movie features some of the best action scenes from the Bleach media franchise. This really is the best that Bleach has ever looked. Despite the shortcomings in the plot and characterization, I felt that the team behind the art and animation really brought their best effort to the table here. I did like the concept behind Hell in the Bleach universe, and even found that some of the imagery was pretty grotesque and brutal, which is exactly what you expect from a place like Hell. Continuing the same trend with the previous movies, the operatic soundtrack for this movie is a great addition. And once again, the credit for the musical composition goes to Shiro Sagisu. The music really adds to the visuals and helps convey the terror and misery within Hell. I really didn't intend to dislike this movie or want to find its flaws. I was in fact looking forward to watching it. I remember when it came out, I did enjoy it a lot, but having to look at it with a critical lens, it really does fall apart due to its flaws and obvious shortcomings. To put everything into perspective, this was the fourth movie where Ichigo battles a villain, the Soul Society disagrees with his actions, but eventually Ichigo's will to protect is too overpowered and he ends up saving the day. The end. The movies follow a very formulaic plot, and I had hoped with the involvement of Kubo this movie would have been a breath of fresh air. Instead, they canned Kubo's ideas and banged his name onto the promotional media. As a fan of this franchise, I really feel cheated by this. It does make me wonder what kind of ideas Kubo had suggested in his meeting with the scriptwriter, and what this movie may have turned out to be like if they had better communication and organisation for the production of the movie. What did you think of Bleach Hellverse? Let me know if this video has changed your mind about this movie, or if you still found it to be an enjoyable experience. Recently on the channel, I reviewed the second OVA of Bleach and I was very disappointed. But despite this, I had high expectations for the first OVA of Bleach. By fans, it is regarded as a solid piece of work. And this is for several reasons, of which include excellent art and animation, being more faithful to the manga, and in general, hearing a lot of praise for it over the 15 years that I've been a fan of Bleach. So after having just watched this 30 minute OVA, I want to share with you my thoughts on it. Going over the story that is told, the differences that this OVA has with the manga and the anime adaptation, as well as going over some bits of information that you may not have known about this OVA. And finally, by the end of this video, you'll know whether if you should go and check out this OVA or not. So let's begin my review and breakdown of the first Bleach OVA. This OVA is named after the third volume of Bleach, which is titled Memories in the Rain. This is because this half an hour OVA attempts to adapt chapters 17 to 25, which comprises the entirety of Bleach Volume 3. The Memories in the Rain OVA has a lot of differences from its anime adaptation. Chapters 17 to 25 are adapted into episode 7 to 9 of the anime. For the most part, the anime has a lot of filler and padding, resorting to even adding an entire side storyline of a Shinigami being tasked by the Onmitsukido to locate Rukia, while the OVA remains much closer to the source material, having very little to no filler content. And any added content that does appear within the OVA adds to the story that is being told. And I'll give an example of an addition that is made to the OVA, which adds to the source material in a meaningful way. So, very similar to the sealed sword Frenzy OVA, the Memories in the Rain OVA was created for the 2004 Jump Super Anime Talk. And what some of you may not know is that this OVA was actually the first anime adaptation of any Bleach manga content, as it served as the pilot episode for the Bleach anime. As we know, it is a retelling of the events that occur between episodes 7 to 9 and chapters 17 to 25 of the manga. It pays particular attention to the emotions and feelings that Ichigo has regarding the death of his mother. After the title screen of the OVA, we are shown the poem that features at the start of Volume 3. The poem that goes, If I were the rain, that joins the sky and the earth that otherwise never touch, could I also join two hearts as one? We then cut to a flashback six years ago, on the 17th of June, where on a rainy day, Ichigo had been walking alongside a riverbank with his mother. We are quickly shown the events that lead up to the death of Ichigo's mother, as we then cut back to school as the OVA begins to adapt chapters 17 to 25. To quickly summarise the events that occur within this OVA, Ichigo and his family are going to see the grave of their mother. On their way there, they meet Rukia. After some time, while Ichigo's sisters are praying at their mother's grave, they are attacked by a mysterious hollow. We quickly learn the identity of this hollow as the Grand Fisher, the hollow who was responsible for the death of Ichigo's mother. After transforming into a Shinigami form, he learns about how the Grand Fisher kills his prey, and how in particular the hollow enjoys targeting women. Initially, it appears that the Grand Fisher has the upper hand, until he changes the lure that is attached to his head into Ichigo's mother. This angers him, and after proving that his tricks are not enough to deceive him, Ichigo is able to 
successfully stab the Grand Fisher, who has no choice but to retreat. The OVA then wraps up with Ichigo speaking to his father about the death of Masaki, as his father reassures him that nobody blames him for the death of Masaki, and instead he should live his life to his fullest, because after all, his life was valuable enough to be saved by the one that Ishin had loved. After speaking to his father, Ichigo tells Rukia that he wants to get stronger in order to kill the Grand Fisher in the future, requesting for her to allow him to be a Shinigami for a little while longer. And this then brings an end to the OVA. So I mentioned earlier that this OVA is more of a faithful adaptation of the manga than episode 7 to 9 of the anime. The most notable piece of filler content that was within the anime that isn't within the OVA is the omission of the Shinigami Ikichiro Saido. He was the Shinigami who had been working for the Onmitsukido who was assigned to find Rukia within the world of the living. He is present within episodes 7, 8 and 9 and there is no real reason for him to be there. His entire purpose is meaningless and his appearances serve to extend scenes within the anime. The only meaningful aspect of his character is that through him we get some early glimpses of the soul society within the anime. The Memories in the Rain was about focusing on Ichigo's feelings and his emotions and how he felt about the death of his mother, but I feel like the anime adaptation of these chapters steers away from this, especially in regards to how this Shinigami who was tasked to retrieve Rukia ends up teasing her that she is staying within the world of the living in order to pursue a relationship with Ichigo. I felt like this was completely unnecessary and just didn't need to be there, and I feel like scenes like this all too often occur within the anime, where they try to ship Ichigo and Rukia together, which are completely absent from the manga. Now after discussing some of the issues with the anime adaptation of these manga chapters, let's now focus more on the OVA. The OVA has a very short runtime of 29 minutes, and in this time it attempts to adapt 9 chapters of the manga. In general, it is very successful at what it attempts to do, but because of this half an hour runtime, it is inevitable that this OVA does have some differences with its manga counterpart. I'm going to be covering some of these differences now, but I do want to emphasize that the changes that are made within this OVA are less detrimental to the changes that are made within episode 7 to 9 of the anime. While watching this OVA, I had the third volume of Bleach in my hand and I was following along with the scenes that it was adapting, and in general, scenes that are not absolutely vital for the progression of the story are cut, and in one instance that I'm about to go over, there is an addition that is made which I feel like adds to the story. So the first notable change between the OVA and the manga is that during the OVA, Rukia is with Yuzu and Karin when the Grand Fisher first attacks them, while in the manga, she is accompanied with Ichigo who is rushing to protect his sisters. While on their way to the Grand Fisher, she tells Ichigo that whenever he is ready to speak about the death of his mother, she will be there for him to listen to him, but until that day, she will be waiting. This entire speech about Rukia being there for Ichigo is omitted from the OVA, and again, I don't think that it is for any other reason than the short runtime of the OVA. Not everything that occurs within 9 chapters can be included within a half an hour OVA unfortunately, and for the sake of runtime, a lot of comedic moments that occur within the manga are cut, especially in regards to the character of Kon. One other very interesting piece of information regarding Kon's appearance within this OVA is that he is actually voiced by Kubo himself, who voices two lines for his character. You'll notice him speaking after Rukia tells him to protect Ichigo's sisters. While watching the OVA, I had to pause because Kon's voice sounded different, and after having looked it up, sure enough, Kubo had made a cameo appearance within this pilot episode. So the most notable addition that is made to this OVA is when Rukia remembers that there are two kinds of battles while Ichigo is facing off against the Grand Fisher. Now we know from chapter 23, Rukia hesitates to help Ichigo, as she remembers a mysterious flashback from an individual who asks the question, what about his honour? Without much context within the manga, Rukia remembers a flashback where she is told that there are two kinds of battles, the first being a battle to preserve life, while the second being a battle to preserve honour. Sure enough, this scene is extended within the OVA. We get a reveal of this mysterious character who had asked Rukia about honour. It is indeed Captain Ukitake. We even get a brief glimpse of Kayan battling against the parasitic hollow. These are events that occur from chapters 135. I feel like adding to this flashback emphasised the similarity between Kayan and Ichigo's struggle. Kayan had been fighting for the sake of his wife who was killed by the hollow, while Ichigo is fighting for the sake of his mother who was killed by the Grand Fisher. And in both instances, Rukia had to prevent herself from getting involved in order to preserve Ichigo and Kayan's honour. I feel like this is an excellent addition to the OVA, and I believe that chapter 135 was released just a short time before the release of this OVA, so I think that it is incredible that they were able to include it within here. I totally approved expanding on scenes in this manner, as opposed to how episodes 7 to 9 of the anime were treated, where any additions that were made were just filler content that didn't need to be there. And the last few points before the Grand Fisher escapes, within the manga he ends up transforming into Ichigo's mother, and taunts Ichigo before escaping, while in the OVA he transforms into the little girl that Ichigo had saw on the day that his mother had died. And the last significant change between the OVA and the manga is that scenes of Orihime leaving 
Tatsuki's home are cut from the OVA. But like I'd mentioned, despite all of these moments being cut, I'm still very impressed with what this OVA manages to accomplish within its 29 minute runtime. It does an incredible job of adapting chapters 17 to 25 far more faithfully than its anime counterpart, with fewer instances of filler material and needless padding. The Memories in the Rain OVA also has an excellent ending which previews the Soul Society arc, and it also introduces us to the various cast members of the Gote 13. This ending sequence has flawless art and animation throughout. This is also a praise that needs to be given to this OVA in general. It has superb animation quality, incredible art and direction, and in general I believe that it is one of the best adaptations of the Bleach manga that we have received, and it does surprise me that this was the pilot for the Bleach anime. I would have loved if the series had continued with this quality, but because of the time that the Bleach anime was created this would have been impossible to do. Having to follow a strict weekly schedule for the anime, while also paying particular attention to not catch up to the manga, unless the anime had taken a break and had gone down the seasonal approach that we all too often see now, filler and needless padding was going to be an inevitability. It is only very recently that shonen series have started to take breaks, and have allowed for more buffer space to build between the anime and the manga, but this OVA really does give you a glimpse of what could have been if Studio Piro had brought their A game to the Bleach anime. This OVA is a must see for any fan of Bleach, as it focuses a lot on the character development and feelings of Ichigo, and it's a perfect example of quality over quantity, as it condenses episodes 7 to 9 into one very enjoyable OVA, and if you want my honest opinion I didn't want it to end. So if you've never seen this OVA before I urge you to go and check it out as soon as possible. So I've just gotten done with watching the Bleach second OVA titled The Seal Sword Frenzy. I thought that it would be fitting to cover an OVA since I've spoken about all of the Bleach movies. So in this video I'm going to be talking about the plot that unfolds, the characters that feature within the story, what I liked about this OVA and what I disliked about it, and in the end deciding whether if you should go and check this out or not. So let's get into my review of The Sealed Sword Frenzy. This OVA was released during the anime tour of Jump Festa 2005. As of recently Bleach fans consider Jump Festa to be like a meme, where we all look forward to the event year on year expecting Bleach news but continue to be disappointed. But what most people don't know about Jump Festa is that it holds a separate tour to several different cities across Japan, and this is titled the Jump Super Anime Tour. And during these tours, exclusive newly animated specials or shorts from very popular Jump series are showcased. To typically attend one of these Jump Super Anime Tours, you have to send in an application form which is printed within Weekly Shonen Jump, selecting which city you would like to attend for the tour. Not everybody who sends in an application form gets selected to attend. So imagine if you're a lucky Japanese teenager in 2005 and you get the opportunity to attend the Jump Super Anime Tour, and you're presented with this train wreck of a Bleach OVA. The OVAs and specials that are featured within the Jump Super Anime Tour are typically released on DVD a few months later. But imagine if you had no experience of Bleach, and you had attended the Jump Super Anime Tour to watch another OVA special from a series that you like, like One Piece or Yu-Gi-Oh, and you come across this Bleach OVA, you probably would never even check the series out, because of how terrible this OVA is. So the story follows a Shinigami called Baishin, who was sealed by the Soul Society over 400 years ago. During this OVA, they really attempt to make you care for this Shinigami, but because of the very short runtime of 32 minutes, there's nowhere near enough time for us to develop a meaningful connection with him. The OVA begins with, as you've guessed it, Baishin being released from the seal that was placed onto him. The premise reminds me a lot of Dragon Ball Z Movie 9, Bojack Unbound. So in typical fashion, the Soul Society are alerted to the release of Baishin, and some Shinigami are sent on an urgent mission to the world of the living. And this is where Renji has an unforgettable introduction within the story. As he appears with a shotgun, not only does he shoot Ichigo's dad with it, he also very confusingly attempts to battle against Baishin with this very shotgun. Baishin ends up attacking Ichigo while he is with Renji, and it is at this point that they end up being saved by Captain Hitsugaya. They regroup at Urahara's shop, and unfortunately we don't really get to see Urahara within this OVA. But while there, other captains from the Soul Society arrive, including Kimpachi, Uki Kitake, Shunsui, Soifon, and lastly Yuriichi. Now what are these incredibly powerful characters utilised for? Now if you guessed splitting up and fighting against Hollows all across Karakura Town then you would be correct. All of these captains are brought in to battle against Hollows when we know that captains have the potential to destroy multiple Hollows with the flick of a finger. But during this OVA they seem to be overly exerting themselves like they've got nothing better to do. So while the captains
Raisins are battling Hollows, Ichigo, Renji and Rukia eventually come across Baishin, who ends up draining Ichigo's spiritual pressure like he's Android 19 attacking Yamcha. It is here that we learn that Baishin had been attacking Ichigo because of his lack of control over his own spiritual pressure, as it is constantly leaking from his body. Baishin does end up activating his Bankai form as he transforms into Gajiol from Fairy Tail, and it is at this point that Rukia and Renji are easily defeated. Hitsugaya does arrive to assist them, but he too fails. Now with most of the characters taken out and the OVA runtime running very short, Ichigo is left with no choice but to activate his Bankai. He ends up overpowering and defeating Baishin, as we understand that the enemy of this OVA had trained to the extent that he had become one with his Zanpakuto, and he had been absorbing Ichigo's spiritual pressure because he had wanted his body back. We do get a very brief moment where an attempt is made for us to feel sympathy for Baishin. Well, let's be honest, none of us could give a crap about this character. And it genuinely made me laugh how the characters were just stood there after Baishin's defeat and sad OST was playing. You cannot convince me that any of them cared for Baishin. I think the worst offense of this OVA is that Kimpachi didn't get to battle against Baishin. We only get to see him briefly take out a handful of hollows. The rest of the time during the OVA, he is running around Karakura Town with no sense of direction looking for Baishin. Of course, at the end of the OVA, there's a credit sequence, and we get to see various Bleach characters dressed in attire from the world of the living. Now you want to look at what they did to my boy Hisagi. I mean, what on earth is he wearing? Some of these outfits are very hilarious, and right at the end of the OVA, we see Gin, Tozen, and Aizen were sat at a coffee table, as they tell the attendees of the 2005 anime tour to be careful on the way home. Of course, the issue with this OVA is its incredibly short runtime. During this span of 32 minutes, it has to introduce and develop a complete storyline, attempting to make us care about a new villain, as well as providing us a reasonable context for Ichigo and the others to defeat the said villain. This OVA fails spectacularly at attempting to do this. We have a terrible storyline that unfolds. We have regular cast members of the series behaving out of character, a dull villain who has barely any lines within the OVA, and constantly repeats this stupid phrase, I am a blade. The motive for Baishin to separate from his Zanbakdo is haphazardly put together, but like the rest of this OVA, it felt very rushed and contrived. Maybe if this OVA was extended to an hour and it had time to develop the story a bit more, and if it didn't feel so rushed, then it may have been enjoyable. But the entire OVA is poorly executed and rushes from one scene to the next. There are some instances where you'll look at Baishin's character and he'll feel like a ripoff of Kimpachi. He has these similar sadistic expressions that Kimpachi makes, and of course that oversized stature, which makes him come across as very intimidating. When it comes to the battles that take place within this OVA, I feel like we saw a lot more of the characters battling against generic hollows, rather than the actual villain of this OVA. This special takes place after the events of the Soul Society arc, which explains why the other Shinigami are so friendly with Ichigo. My first experience of Bleach was watching the actual anime, but I know that the anime has at least five filler story arcs. I'd only watched the Bount arc because at that time I didn't even know what filler was, and it feels like this OVA was created while the episodes of the Bount arc were being released. I don't think Studio Piro is really good at creating filler content. Maybe in the future I'll have to do some Bleach filler arc reviews, but from what I've seen from this OVA and the Bount arc, they are really doing a disservice to the Bleach manga. Kubo was even asked to draw the DVD cover of the Sealed Sword Frenzy OVA. In a comment that was included with the OVA, Kubo states that while he did design Baishin's character, he wasn't a character that Kubo had created himself, so he wasn't confident with how Baishin should be like. So it is for this reason that Kubo had drawn Baishin with his back to us on the DVD cover. Moving on to the art and animation, the best way to describe it would be very inconsistent. We do have one or two redeemable moments, most notably during Ichigo's final battle against Baishin, but for the most part, the animation is very disappointing. The soundtrack of the OVA is exactly the same as the anime soundtrack, so it's perfectly fine for the most part, with the only issue being that some of the music that is utilized doesn't fit the mood or the tone of the scene that it is playing under. Now if I were to offer some suggestions to improve this OVA, the first would be to reduce the cast of characters that appear within it. I can understand for an anime tour special, you want a lot of fan service, but even with characters like Kimpachi, Hitsugaya, Shunsui, and Nukitake appearing, they are barely utilized, and to be honest, there's no reason for them to really be there. I mean, there are some moments of light comedic relief with Kimpachi running after a train, but it's not like he's Zoro from One Piece, so this gimmick of him having no sense of direction gets really old very quickly. So with cutting the appearances of some of these captains, it may have given us more time to have Baishin's backstory fleshed out, giving us more of a reason for us to sympathize with him as a former captain of the Gote 13, maybe even going into the moments that led up to him becoming one with his Zanpakdo. And the final area that I feel like needed to be padded out was the final battle between Ichigo and Baishin. Maybe if the final battle was padded out a bit more, then Baishin could have had a meaningful exchange with Ichigo and the others, explaining his situation and his circumstances. But none of this occurs. There definitely was potential with the story that was told here, but sadly it just leaves much to be desired. There are one or 
two moments that I did like about this OVA. The first of which is Ichigo's Bankai transformation. I thought that they did an excellent job of animating it, and it was really fun to see an animated sequence of Ichigo actually doing his Bankai, very close to the release of the episode where Ichigo had first showcased this ability. Another notable thing is that Ichigo didn't really meet Hitsugaya during the Soul Society arc, so surprisingly during this OVA we do get to see the two characters being introduced to each other, and it makes complete sense as to why Ichigo doesn't know Hitsugaya's name, and he hilariously refers to him as Little One. And the final thing that I liked about this OVA was the appearance of Renji with a shotgun. This was completely out of the blue and had taken me by surprise, and once more I have to reiterate, I laughed out loud when I had seen Renji fire his shotgun against Baishin. So wrapping this video up with a rushed storyline, low quality animation, and a villain that barely speaks during its runtime, the sealed sword frenzy is not something that I would recommend that you all go rush out and see. In fact, it's not something that I recommend for you guys to watch at all. If anything, it served as a reminder as to how terrible these early Bleach filler stories were. This OVA was released in December of 2005, exactly an entire year from Memories of Nobody. And if you've seen my review of Bleach Movie 1, then you'll know just how much that I liked that movie. So it's surprising for me to see an OVA that I disliked so much, despite it being released so close to the release of Bleach Movie 1. If you enjoy my content, then you can support my channel through Patreon for as little as a dollar a month, or even through YouTube by becoming a channel member. You will gain access to exclusive channel perks and a Discord server which I frequently use. So become a member of my Zero Division and be the first to know about my upcoming videos. And once again, thank you for sticking around till the end of the video, and whatever you contribute will mean a lot to me.